Hey, it's Steve. Welcome back to Clear Direct. Today I'm in the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio for a very specific reason. I'll get more into that later. But what I'm going to talk to you today about is something that doesn't mix very well with aviation, or at least it didn't. But the FAA and the military is progressing through that, and what I'm talking about is a medical condition called sleep apnea. So in part one, I'm gonna talk about sleep apnea and how it affects me as a commercial airline pilot. And then in part two, I'm gonna talk about how it affects my military career in the United States Air Force. So buckle up, it's gonna be a bit of a technical ride. There's gonna be some cool images. I figured this would be a great backdrop to talk about this subject today. I'm Steve Cox. I fly fighters, airliners, and general aviation aircraft. I'm into tech, travel, anything that flies, making friends and videos along the way. So honestly, my objective through producing this vlog is to uh, dispel some of the rumors and hopefully at the outcome of this, one or two of you or maybe more who suspect you might have sleep apnea will go get tested, get treated, and become safer pilots because of it and have longer, healthier lives. All right, so through my 20 plus years of flying professionally, occasionally the subject amongst pilots would be snoring or sleep apnea and always it was, Shh, don't tell anybody about it you're gonna get grounded, your career is over. And up until about 2015, that might as well have been true. But in 2015, the um, FAA, as well as the military, started to learn a little bit more about the disease and how it can be treated and how potentially pilots can be effective flyers. Okay, quick caveat. I'm definitely not a doctor. Um, this was recorded in December of 2019, so things may have changed. Uh, this is applicable in the United States, so international uh, governing bodies may look at this very differently. So quick personal story about the XB-70. I think it crashed before I was alive, but it did crash in the Mojave Desert out of uh, Edwards Air Force Base, and I was stationed at Fort Irwin in California doing a two-year stint with the Army. And we went hiking and checked out some of the uh, the wreckage. It's been pretty, pretty well picked through, but you can find some, some titanium that's uh, it's landing in the uh, in the desert floor from a pretty tragic crash during the research and development. I guess uh, a chase aircraft got caught up in its huge wake vortices and crashed into it and took everybody else out. And under the XB-70's nose, we got oh just an itty bitty SR-71. This place is ginormous. So I would have no idea that I had sleep apnea unless people told me that I snored pretty loudly. I didn't wake up in the middle of the night gasping for air. I wasn't obscenely tired and when I turned 40 I was flying some red eyes to Hawaii and uh, just feeling real lethargic more so than I had previously thought maybe initially it was just because I turned 40 but then I thought you know what at least do the research into it and see if it was something that I should get tested and honestly it was the long-term health benefits is really what uh, showed me that I should probably get it checked out. If you get this treated, you could have heart problems, liver problems, the diabetes, not to mention the short-term wakefulness issues. But of course, then I went into this mode of, well, what if my flying career is over? So that's when I really delved into the research and found that in 2015, the FAA has gotten a quite a bit more progressive. The military, a mm, little bit more behind the times, but I think they're coming along. That's in part two. MiG-29 Fulcrum, that was the baseline threat that Eagle drivers would train against back when I joined in 99 uh, and we've kind of progressed up the food chain of more advanced fighters and more advanced missiles nowadays, but there it is, the dreaded MiG-29 Fulcrum. Small, fast, maneuverable, agile, smoky, doesn't carry a lot, combat radius isn't very big. So what is sleep apnea? There's a couple types of sleep apnea, two main types. There's central sleep apnea, think of central nervous system, it's a neurological disorder. And then the more common kind and more easily treated, which is what I have, is obstructive sleep apnea. And there's also a third kind, which is kind of a mix between the two. But we're gonna be focused on obstructive sleep apnea, which really resides in just the physiology. Essentially, the physiology of the back of your throat causes your uvula and tongue, as you relax and st uh, fall asleep, starts to obviously uh, obstruct your airway. I guess there are some risk factors that can exacerbate the condition, which is um, smoking, 
drinking heavily, you're on sedatives, you're overweight, you're older, those things can kind of exacerbate those things. I mean, F23, why F23? Holy cow. <laughs> Got an old codger fighter pilot talking about how cocky we all are. Uh, not gonna deny it. Anyway, twin Mustang F82. F82G. Okay, so a little bit more about sleep apnea. Uh, apnea is a condition where you stop breathing altogether, right? Short amount of time, long amount of time, doesn't matter, that's an apneic event. Hypopnea is where you have shallow breathing. So together, they come up with an apnea hypopnea index. How many times you have one of those events per hour? So as far as that AHI or apnea hypopnea index goes, zero to 4.9, you don't got it, right? Five to 14.9 is mild, 15 to 30 is moderate, and then above 30 is severe. I had to come back to the YF23. <sighs> and it's a McDonnell Douglas product. So once I got my sleep test and the diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea, uh, how to get it treated. So let's talk about treatment. There are surgical treatments. Uh, I'm not gonna go into those. There are some oral devices that can kind of help lift your jaw and uh, change kind of the back of your throat and hopefully uh, clear that up. Um, I tried one, didn't really work, plus a lot of jaw pain for me. So ended up uh, opting for CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure, essentially a pneumatic stent. That's the best description for it. Obviously, you're gonna have to wear a mask or a nose mask, and it provides uh, pressure to you to keep that airway open. Now, there's a BiPAP, there's a uh, auto CPAP, and there's a CPAP. I won't go into the, de the descriptions of those, but more and more, I think they're going towards uh, auto CPAPs that have kind of brains built into them, and they can uh, adjust the pressure up or down, so it's a little bit more comfortable when you go to bed, and if it senses that you're having an event, it'll increase the pressure, open up that airway, and you should be good to go. And the cool thing is, is that they log all of your usage, compliance usage, for uh, purposes of proving to governing bodies. Uh, DOT requires it, I believe, for, um, for truck drivers, commercial truck drivers, and then of course the FAA, and then also for the DOD for military purposes. The two factors of compliance that I've seen isn't your AHI, it is how many nights that you use it, and on those nights that you use it, how many hours, and it varies per uh, per agency. So the FAA is 75% of nights, you got to use it, and you got to get at least six hours uh, average of those nights. So I got set up with the CPAP machine, had to get fitted for the uh, nose pillow. I didn't have the full face mask. They're telling me now that I might need a full face mask, uh, but the nose pillow seemed to work pretty well for me. Not right away though, it took some time to get used to. I didn't have very good sleep the first couple nights as you can imagine. Uh, it's not the most comfortable thing until you get used to it. You do get used to it and in fact, I prefer to sleep with it. I know I'm gonna get a good night's sleep or at least I have the chance to get a good night's sleep. I can wake up, I can look at my numbers, see how my sleep was and uh, on my way. Much in the same way as it, I, it took a while to get used to, I didn't start waking up full of energy right away. In fact. I still don't, I'm just not a morning person. I never jump out of bed ready to attack the day. But where I did feel it is in the afternoons. I didn't quite feel so uh, groggy after lunch and I had some more sustained energy through the rest of the day. The whale, Northrop Tacit Blue aircraft. Check that out. Anyway, so the meat and potatoes of this video is going to the FAA and uh, what happens at that point. So after I got the diagnosis, I called up my FAA medical examiner, gave him a heads up that, hey, and my, uh, my flight physical coming up in a month or so, uh, I'm gonna have a newly diagnosed uh, condition of obstructive sleep apnea. Is that a problem? Can I continue to fly? He said, yep, no problem, continue to fly, see you next month. Showed up next month, again, I told him that I had it. I didn't have any compliance data yet. I just got outfitted with the CPAP. I was kind of freaking out that I would leave that appointment grounded. Well, guess what? I wasn't grounded. They're gonna put you in one of six categories. Even if you don't show up with a, a diagnosis of sleep apnea, have you, do you remember this? They're gonna ask you, do you snore? And you say, yeah, no, never in my life, doc, right? Well, they kind of take a look at your BMI, your, your body mass index, your other risk factors, and they might put you in an elevated category, which they might eventually uh, mandate that you get some sleep testing done. What are the six groups? Group one is what 
I'll hopefully be next year and beyond. It's um, somebody who has an OSA diagnosis and who is being treated and who is on also a special issuance, right? Because it's essentially disqualifying, but you can get pretty easily a special issuance to continue flying as long as uh, the treatment is effective and that it's obstructive sleep apnea and not necessarily the central sleep apnea, the, the neurological kind. Group two. Um, it's where I fit in during my last medical, okay? I had a diagnosis and I didn't have a special issuance yet, compliance reports to follow, okay? Now group three, um, group three, not at risk. You just don't meet one of the risk categories and hopefully this is you and you don't snore and life is good. Okay, group four, where the aero medical uh, examiner determines that there may be a risk but no diagnosis has been assessed yet and you're gonna have a discussion. Group five is where the AME determines there is risk for OSA and the AME requires an apnea assessment, okay? Where they stop buying your BS. Group six is the dreaded group where the AME determines that there is an immediate safety risk which requires an assessment and you're not walking out of the appointment with your medical. Now, sounds to me like this is pretty rare, not a doctor, no statistics to back that up, but they want to keep you flying, but if they assess, I don't know how they do it, but if they assess there's an immediate safety risk, I don't know, you must be like falling asleep in your, um, in your appointment there, then uh, they're gonna do the right thing and ground you. So those are the six groups and how the AME determines which group you fit in. If you want more information, I'll link it below. So now what? So after my appointment, uh, they tell you you need a special issuance. They're gonna uh, send in all the paperwork to the FAA and you can expect that within 90 days, the FAA is gonna send you a packet requiring three things. First thing, it's a signed airman compliance form, essentially stating that you'll be a good boy. Uh, number two, the results and interpretive report from your most recent sleep study pre-treatment and um, a current status report from my sleep doc indicating that treatment is still effective. This is where the um, advance in device technology with vis-a-vis uh, -vis compliance. Now, dragging around your CPAP on an airline trip is not that much fun. I would highly recommend spending your own hard-earned dollars to buy a portable CPAP. I'm lucky the Air Force bought me one. I'm on active duty orders right now, greater than a year out from retirement, uh, and I travel. So those three criteria met, I was able to get one purchased for me, and it is a godsend. Not only in the fact that it's just smaller, but it's a second device. I don't need to unplug and pack up my home device and then repack it up and then et cetera, et cetera. You got two separate devices, you leave one in your roller bag, and you leave one at home. For those of you who aren't treated with CPAP, um, you'll need proof of compliance via other means. So um, essentially, what I, my understanding of that is that you will reaccomplish a sleep test wearing your, your device or post-op uh, after you have surgery. Now they're just showing off. They got a second Blackbird. All right, so you're diagnosed, you're treated, you went open kimono with the FAA and you submitted all your paperwork and you're just waiting, like me right now. It's December 2019 and I haven't heard. I submitted all my paperwork in late August. So I take the stance that no news is good news, um, but I don't see any reason why they should deny my special issuance. My treatment's effective and we'll go from there. So what I'd like to talk about next is living with the disease, okay? A lot of people have it, you're not alone. It's funny the people that I talk about it with go, oh, me too. In fact, a coworker of mine uh, has it too. And we joke every morning we show up to work and we exchange uh, our stats and it's competition who could have the lower AHI. He's still got me beat. Uh, daily I wake up with about 2.5 or so to three. He's sub one. Oh, look, Tweety Bird. I can still hear my ears ringing. First jet I flew, made by Cessna. Tornado, got another aardvark back there, Herc, got an osprey. Anyway, final thoughts, it's been a lot of data. My goal here, honestly, is to spread awareness, and if I could get one of you guys to go get a sleep test and get treated with the ultimate goal of just flying safer and have living longer, healthier lives, then, uh, then that's essentially what I was after. So if you've got any questions, please leave a comment below. Go ahead and hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll talk to you guys in the next one. You're clear direct.